And what the church taught through this council, it said that if man is faithful to himself, I was having a conversation before the meeting when I said that to borrow a phrase from an old army pitch when they say, be all you can be, to be the man that we are meant to be is to seek the truth. And in seeking the truth, we are seeking God. And the church's main job, according to this document, in modern times, is to reorient us to this idea, this reality, that faith and reason go hand in hand. Because one of the things that we live in now, the, the times that we live in now, is that society has disoriented this concept with the idea of moral relativism. You know, they want to tell you that they have the answers, but they don't want you to ask questions. You know, somebody told me, that we had a gathering yesterday at school in celebration of Thanksgiving. Our old principal said, you know, be, be leery of people who have answers to questions that have not been asked. And that kind of stuck with me a little bit. Because asking questions is good. You know, um, and the answer, and this is straight out of the document, Jesus Christ is the answer to the profound questions about the meaning of life. You know, like, why am I here? What is my purpose? You ever ask yourself any of those questions throughout your life? I bet you have. You know, what am I doing? You know, is there more to life than what, what I've got going on? And Jesus Christ is the answer to those questions. In fact, point number four of God Met's Best says that, and this goes back to what we talked about at our last gathering about forming our consciences, that we have to inform or form our lives in light of the gospel. And the gospel of John tells us that the word became flesh in Christ. So we have to inform our lives in the life of Christ. You know, this discussion of incarnation, this wasn't one of the intended things to talk about, but if you study the life of Christ, he didn't do anything in the Gospels without a purpose. And when we think about the incarnation, I think oftentimes we think about him humbling himself and him bringing himself down to our level in all things but sin. But we need to also remember that what he's done as well is he has demonstrated to us the dignity of us being human because we are made in the image of God. And that's also one of the primary messages that comes out of this document. We need to remember that we are sons of God and what that really means because I don't think we live our lives that way. This, this, it's called filial love. This, that we love God as sons of God. That we can go to him in all our needs. And that we spend time talking to him in prayer. Which, I made a note here that, uh, that comes out of the document. It says, what is pastoral concern and I, you know, I alluded to this before. I used to have this kind of idea that when we talked about pastoral things, that there was this kind of touchy feely stuff that, you know, I wasn't really oriented toward. But what it really means is search for true good of man. Okay, I, I can go with that. And the second part of it is just the promotion of values that are ingrained in us. And what does that mean? That's called natural law. The fact that we are wired to know what is right and what is wrong. Society wants to tell us that that doesn't really exist. That there is no true right and true wrong. But our souls, we're infused with that, with that idea that we know what is right and what is wrong. Now we may fight it. Okay? And this, this concept of the true good of man is juxtaposed <coughs> with what we have in society. Today, when we've 
this country was founded on these concepts from the Enlightenment period of like utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number. But we need to be careful about that because when you start talking about the greatest good or the good for all, that turns back on itself when you start talking about the dignity of man. Because when, when you start to lose utility or worth in terms of what you can give to society, you can just cast you aside. That we have countries now that uh, have laws on the books for euthanasia, but they'll call mercy killing. We don't have a right to decide <coughs> that sort of thing. And there's some legitimate fears about that in this Obamacare. <coughs> I mean, it's a document that was written 50 years ago that's applicable to the very things that are taking place right now. That faith has the answers because it keeps the questions alive. And just like I said a little while ago, society doesn't want those questions to be alive. Because if you're not asking those questions, if you're not seeking the truth, you don't get to the answer. God, the point number 41 from the document says that the split between faith and people's everyday, the split, that this idea that we can separate our Sunday life from our Monday through Saturday life calls the greatest era, er, error of our ages. Okay? It's a disunity of life. This, and you know, I think it was uh, Deacon Walter that said at one of his homilies a few weeks ago, that society has changed even the language, particularly here in the United States when we used to talk about freedom of religion and now they talk about freedom of worship because they want to pigeonhole us into having a Sunday life. Oh, you can have your worship in the church on Sunday, but by all means don't bring it out into the public world. We, that's precisely what we're called to do. That this concept of no religion in politics that we talked about a couple of weeks ago as well. Now that doesn't mean that, that we go around with the catechism and hit people over the head. It means that our call, our mission as the church is to live the gospel in our daily lives in the way that we interact with people. And then when we're asked questions... And I bet some of you have been asked questions about, well, what is it that you Catholics really believe? Or why are you all worked up about this HHS mandate? I hear you've got exceptions. You need to know the answers. And you need to know where to find the answers to be able to give informed Because inf here's the deal. And it was uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen who said that he had never met anybody who really despised the church but what they despised was their lack of understanding, their misconceptions about what we believe. And I contend that, that we as faithful Catholics have a responsibility first to live it, because I think that's the greatest testimony, that's the greatest witness. When they see that unity of life, when they see that you're really living your values and your everything, I would say that that is the essence of God Emet's best, out in the modern world, being the light of Christ to others. Because that's powerful stuff. You know, and I, I work with teenagers all day long, and one thing that they are very astute at is seeing a disunity of life. When someone says one thing and does another, they pick, on, they pick up on that in a heartbeat. <laughs> and so we have to live our lives uh, in unity. So, I'll close out with telling you that um, Pope John Paul II, if you read any of his encyclicals and his entire pontificate, was dedicated to putting back, 
putting Vatican II into effect and explaining the documents. Uh, for example, hand in hand it, that goes with Gaudium et Spes and explaining its meaning is his, encycl is his encyclical called Faith and Reason. That's a great document to read, especially if you have a friend or family member who's an atheist, okay, or who, um, you know, a lot of atheists um, think that if you're, you know, tend to be scholarly people, who think that religion is just for the dumb and illiterate. This is a wonderful document to challenge them to read, because You'll hear this out there. You'll hear people, well, you know, the church is anti-science. Okay? You know where most science comes from? The church. So they go hand in hand. So the final one that I want to... So the two main points of, of God him its best that, that John Paul II focused on... Points 22 and, 40, and 24. And so I'll close out with number 24. Indeed, the Lord Jesus, we pray to the Father that all may be one as we want, as we one. From John chapter 17, verses 21 through 22. Opened up Vistas close to human reason, for he implied a certain likeness between the union of the divine persons and the unity of God's sons in truth and charity. This likeness reveals that man who is the only creature on earth which God willed for itself cannot fully find himself except through the sincere gift of himself. We can't find who we fully are until we are willing to give of ourselves to others and living the gospel in our everyday lives. You know, that was, that was a timely message. 